he rang Joel that night and said, oh my God, have you seen the pictures? Have you seen David Beckham's just put a green and gold scarf around his neck? This is just PR disaster for us. And Joel apparently said, no, nah, I'm not worried. Welcome to the latest episode of season two of Football Uncovered. In season one, we took you inside Blackburn, Leeds, Portsmouth and Liverpool, FIFA and a lot more. Heard about extraordinary stories of football chaos, cock-ups and outright corruption. This season, we've been delving inside eight more Premier League clubs, as well as having two special episodes. One about life after the Premier League and one about the very future of club football at the highest level. I'm your host, Will Brazier, and with me on every episode is Sporting Intel's Nick Harris. Nick, how are you? I'm good, thanks. Really looking forward to this. I'm sure Laurie's got a lot of uh, good stories to tell us. Yes, um, it's not just me and Nick. This season we'll also be joined by a guest, usually a fan of the club we're talking about, or someone who has followed them very closely and knows all the inside stories. As well as sharing all the usual inside from the stories of the club, we'll be looking at the court. Uh, we'll be looking, of course, at the owners of the club, how they came to be, where they've taken the club so far, but most importantly, what's next? Today's guest is Laurie Whitwell, not just a fan of the club we are here to talk about today, but also the Manchester United correspondent for the Athletic. You can find Laurie at Twitter, at Laurie Whitwell, and he's also a regular on the Athletic pod about Manchester United, of course, Talk of the Devils. Laurie, how are you? I'm good, Will. Thank you for that um, for that build-up, and, and hopefully I can uh, live up to Nick's expectations for this one. Well, I hope um, people are watching on the, the YouTube episode, because there's some fantastic haircuts flying around this morning, aren't there? <laughs> Absolutely. Yours um, is number you, one, Will. Hey, come on, stop that now. Uh, you're a Manchester United fan from Manchester, I was going to say, how does that happen? But it sounds quite clear, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, well, to be fair, Stockport. So I suppose, you know, Edgeley Park, I could see the floodlights of Stockport County's ground from Good my ground, house yeah. where my parents still live. But um, my dad was a United fan, so he took us to Old Trafford as a kid. Uh, yeah, first first game was 95-96 season when Cantona scored against Seaman, you know, the chest on the and then lobbing it over him. Uh, we were in like tier two and of the North Stand, which had kind of just opened. And um, I had this idea going into it, thinking I was going to go and get Cantona's autograph or, you know, get get Fergie's autograph. And obviously when we get there, we're absolutely miles away from the pitch and I've got no chance at all. So it was a bit of a welcome to uh, fo what football reality as a fan is like, but it was a good good game as well. And then journalistically, obviously the athletics absolutely booming at the moment, but how did, how did you get into that path? Um, yeah, uh, so obviously worked at the Daily Mail for um, I think, uh, 10 years, maybe in the end, um, something like that. Uh, no, eight, eight or nine years, maybe. And um, that, that was through the graduate scheme that they have, which I think is really valuable. Obviously, me and Nick were sort of colleagues at that time, weren't we, Nick? You know, this Wimbledon <laughs> coverage that we did together and, and various other bits. Um, and, uh, and, and then when... So I was covering the Midlands at the time, did, did Leicester winning the title, which was obviously absolutely bonkers and, and Wales getting to the semis of the Euros. Um, and then the Athletic started and I, I basically just sort of, you know, sort, sort out whether it was a possibility. And then Alex Kajelski, who I'd worked with at the Mail previously, he's the editor in chief um, in the UK. And he said, actually, would you be up for covering Manchester United? And that made a load of sense for me because my family, friends are, are up in Manchester and it, it just fitted really neatly. Um, Laura, obviously we're here to talk about football, but sort of the business behind that as well and the Glazers. I was going to say, it, it, it's it's easy to forget uh, now, sort of 16 years on from the takeover, how important the role of a racehorse was <laughs> in the fact that the Glazers ended up owning Manchester United. Maybe younger listeners won't, won't be familiar with the story of Rock of Gibraltar, who was like a, a Group 1 winning uh, thoroughbred racehorse, who was... Um, uh, you know, who became the, the the central figure in a in a major sort of row between two Irish racing magnates, John Magnier and J.P. McManus, um, also known as the Colmore Mafia after their Colmore stud in Ireland, and Sir Alex Ferguson, um, who thought that he owned half of this racehorse. And, and um, he didn't, in fact, own half the racehorse. He'd been given... Um, he was kind of lent the ownership so that when the racehorse won or whatever, he could go along and, and, and be the owner for the day. And that eventually it was turned out that he'd been given some of the breeding rights to the horse, but he didn't own it. And this became a really, really bitter dispute, which in the normal run of things wouldn't have been a big deal. But the fact was Magnier and McManus owned a big chunk of Manchester United through a company called Cubic Expression. And ultimately they became a thorn in Ferguson's side and a thorn in the side of the United board. And ultimately they ended up selling their crucial stakeholding to 
uh, McMahon to to the Glazer family that allowed the Glazers to get get a. Uh, uh, into a position where they could take over the club. I don't know if that's the sort of thing that that you remember at the time, Laurie. Yeah, so yeah, very very much so, really. And um, I mean, it was, it was the irony being that Ferguson had brought JP McManus and and John Magnier to United to kind of protect himself because at the time he was he was friends with them, and he realised that it was useful to have people owning shares in the club that were allies. Um, and then obviously that flipped and it became a diff- you know, a, the totally opposite situation. And it was, it was fraught, wasn't it, for a, a, a long period of time, a good year. Um, and, and Ferguson opposed the, the Glazer takeover. You know, they fought you know, against it. David Gill is public, publicly on record saying that it was, it were de- is the, the road to ruin and it was a dangerous path for United to go down. Um, so they, there was, you know, it was pushback against it for sure. Um, and yeah, the Rock of Gibraltar thing, I mean, you know, it was, he, he, I remember going to the book launch for his autobiography after he retired and there was a question about it from the audience and it got very short shrift from Ferguson. And there's only like a very small mention of it in his, in his book, isn't there? And I, I think it's a very delicate area for, for anyone to sort of try and nudge, nudge about uh, with, with Ferguson. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, obviously, still got his love for for racehorses. He was at Aintree, wasn't he? Um, at the weekend, getting a, a hat trick of, of winners in Liverpool. Uh, and yeah. and J, JP McManus owns the winning Grand National horse, right? Manila Times, I think. Absolutely, uh, yeah. So it, it's still kind of relevant, you know, this this dynamic from the takeover in two thousand and five until two thousand and ten. There was a real sense of jeopardy and potential peril around the way they'd done the deal they'd they'd put a couple of hundred million pounds at most of their own money into what was a 790 million pound takeover and then they borrowed various tranches of cash including some really really dangerous pick paying kind loans which at one point had annual interest of 17 percent and this was described as a ticking time bomb so uh, so, so they were paying back tens and tens of millions of pounds and if they got to the point where they wouldn't be able to refinance those loans on a more sensible basis, there was this sense of peril that the club could have could have gone tits up. So some fans were obviously so disenchanted they went off and started their own club, FC United of Manchester. Other fans who remained were very much Man United fans still of the club, if not the owners, and they began the, the Love United, Hate Glazer campaign. That's the, the LUHG slogans that you could see on lampposts and graffiti around the city, stickers, uh, the green and gold campaign so for five years this went on a very sort of real idea that the Glazers were totally out of control even David Gill privately was the although he was working with them as the CEO of the club he was he was scared that they were too aggressive in terms of needing to to squeeze all the money they could out of commercial deals in order to pay off these these um these loans and arguably the peak anger at the Glazers was probably early 2010 when the club's debts had increased to more than 700 million quid um, by early March, the Red Knights group of prominent United fans made it known they wanted to launch a, a, a buyout. That was never going to happen for various reasons, although it was led by a Goldman Sachs chief economist, Jim O'Neill, who was a United fan. Um, it was never going to happen, not least because the Glazers were totally unwilling to sell, but it galvanised the fans against the Glazers. And I don't know if you remember, but I think it was March 2010 when David Beckham, then playing for Milan, came back to Old Trafford. Uh, Milan got spanked 4 0 in a Champions League game. And Beckham uh, left the pitch taking a green and gold scarf from a Manchester United fan and draping it around his neck. And, you know, that was kind of absolute PR disaster for the Glazers. You've got this iconic figure of David Beckham now aligning himself with the Love United Hate Glazer campaign at a point when the debts were perilously, you know, dangerous, dangerously threatening the club. Um, even some of the Glazers' closest advisors were starting to worry. And one of those advisors was a guy called Tessin Nayani, who was a banker who helped them do the deal in the first place. And he wrote a book about it all this years later. And um, um, he was he was worried that night. He rang Joel that night and said, oh, my God, have you seen the pictures? Have you seen David Beckham's just put a green and gold scarf around his neck? This is just PR disaster for us. And Joel apparently said, no, nah, I'm not worried because uh, people are talking about us. And why are they talking about us? Because we're Manchester United. Let them talk. We're fine. I guess to finish up, we have we have to sort of really ask what is the what is the point of Manchester United in 2021? What are they? What what can they be? Can they return to being 
serial winners of the league title and challengers to to the deep stages of the Champions League? Is that something we can realistically expect of them in the next few years under Oli Gunnar Solskjaer? That is the big question, isn't it? You know, as we reflected on earlier, you know, Solskjaer, he's, he's not got the pedigree of Jose Mourinho. He didn't come in with two Champions League you know, victories, didn't come in with the pedigree of Louis van Gaal um, and his success with Ajax and Bayern and Barcelona. Um, but he does understand the club and football. And, he, you know, I think he is improving. I think as a manager, you know, he, he understands um, what it does take. Uh, to to win those kind of things, and I think his recruitment's been pretty good. You know, I I, I accept that we sort of go through phases, don't we, where we decide whether Dan James is a, a United quality player or not, or whether Harry Maguire it was worth eighty million pounds or not. But I think you have to say that okay, you know, he's he's brought Harry Maguire and he plays every week. He's brought Aaron Wan Bissaka and he plays every week. He's brought Bruno Fernandes and he's changed, he's changed the club. He's managed to get Paul Pogba to a place where he's actually playing the best football of his Manchester United career. Um, He's, he's negotiated the Dean Henderson, David De Gea situation well, and now it looks like Henderson's got the gloves, and he's but he's been delicate with that and, and not kind of dismissed a player that's served United so well um, too quickly, even though he was you know in a, in a bad patch of form. Um, so I think he's he's handled situations adeptly, and he, he does. Know, I, I would back him to bring in players that would enhance Manchester United and get them to that place. Um, it's just whether or not United you know, we'll actually go and spend that money in the right way at the right moment because we had last season, you know, the long running saga of Jaden Sancho. Um, clearly that was Solskjaer's number one and United were trying to do that. But realistically, they were never going to come to the situation, that the price tag that Dortmund wanted. And then ultimately it left them, you know, sort of, frantically trying to bring in players on deadline day, one being Edinson Cavani, who's turned out to be a really good signing, but he missed the first month of the season when United lost he, he, the, the first match. You know, he came on as a sub against Arsenal, which United lost, and that was their third defeat of the season. They've only lost four games in the Premier League all season. So if he'd have been, if, it, if they'd United had gone, okay, Jane Sancho's too much, we can... Uh, go and go for Edinson Cavani, bring him in first game of the season, bang. Those results could have been different and this could actually be a genuine title race, you know, rather than United sort of in, in the distance. 